Our Bible reading this evening is from the Gospel, the Good News, according to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. If you want to turn there in your Bible, Luke chapter 2, beginning in the first verse. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, as we meditate on the good news, on the gospel that you have shared with us, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I timed this message earlier. It's only about 50 minutes long, so we'll be doing great here. <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> so Luke chapter 2 tells a story of rival kings, which is a very dangerous thing. It begins with Caesar Augustus commanding a census. You see the power of Caesar. He signs a document and the whole world moves. This is what kings did in the ancient world. If they wanted to raise more taxes, more money, if they wanted to be able to draft more people into their armies, if they wanted to build up their own wealth and their own power over others and at the expense of others, this is what they did. In, in the Bible, a census is kind of a suspicious thing. It's a thing that the tyrants or despotic rulers do. So in, if you want to go home and read this, 2 Samuel 24, King David in the Old Testament takes a census and he actually gets rebuked for doing it. But then there's another king here in Luke chapter 2, and he is born of the royal line of King David, the house of David, and he's born in the city of David, verses 4 and 11 tell us, the royal city. And he is called the Christ, or Messiah, which means the anointed one, like, like they would anoint the ancient kings with oil when they crowned them. But he's also called, this little baby, this king who's born, he's called the Lord. And it's easy for us to miss that, but that is the title that was used for God Almighty all through the Old Testament. The Lord is born for you. This king was glorious and powerful in a way beyond anything Caesar Augustus could possibly fathom or imagine. We can see a little hint of his glory and his power in the armies of angels that are there singing full-throated praises to hail the birth of this king. But this king lays his glory aside in order to save his people. 
The Christian philosopher Kierkegaard tells a story, it's a parable really, about why God comes among us and what that means in humility as a little baby. And this is the story he tells. He says, imagine there's a king who falls in love with a humble maiden. She has no royal pedigree, no education, no standing in the royal court. She's dressed in rags. She lives in a hovel. She lives the ragged and dirty life of a peasant. But for reasons no one could quite figure out, the king fell madly in love with her, the way kings sometimes do. It was beyond explaining, but he loved her. And anxiously, the king wondered, how in the world could he reveal his love to this girl? How could he bridge the chasm that separated the two of them? His advisors, of course, told him, oh, it's simple. Uh, Just command her to become his wife, to be the queen, and it would be done, easy. He was a man of immense power. Foreign dignitaries feared before him. All his own courtiers trembled before his voice. People feared his wrath. But power, even unlimited power, cannot command love. The king could force her to be physically present in his palace, but he couldn't force love for him to be present in her heart. He might be able to command her obedience, but what he longed for was intimacy of heart and oneness of spirit with his beloved. So he met with his advisors again, and they suggested he try to bridge the chasm between them by by elevating this girl to his level. He, He could shower her with riches and titles. He could dress her in purple and silk and have her crowned as queen, but... The king understood that if he radiated the sun of his magnificence over her, if she saw all the wealth and pomp and power of his greatness, how could he ever really know if she loved him for him or just for all the riches that she could get from him? There was only one way the king decided. So one day he rose up and took off his crown and laid aside his scepter, took off his royal robes, and took upon himself the life of a peasant. And he didn't just take the outward appearance of a a servant, he actually became a servant. It was his actual life, his actual neighbor, his, his, his actual work, his actual burden. He became as ragged as the one he loved so that he could win her and she could be his forever. It was the only way. And his humble raggedness became the very sign of his love and his presence to her. Our God wants us, every one of you in this room, God wants us. He wants us to share in the joy of our master. He wants us to be a part of his family, his church, his bride. He wants us to share in his own everlasting life. And he knows that a total revelation of the Almighty, the everywhere present, the all-knowing, the all-powerful God, the ground and foundation of existence and being itself, he knows that a total revelation would completely overwhelm us. But our Lord comes to us in humility. He comes just as a baby, just as every one of us in this room once was. And then he became a toddler, and a little child, and a teenager, and finally an adult. He came as one of us so that we could see him, so that we could know him, so that we could relate to him. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. Through Jesus, we can actually know the God who's actually beyond knowing. It's an amazing thing. And we can know that he really understands us. He understands our struggles. He gets where we are when we're spinning our wheels and screwing up sometimes. He gets the temptations that we face. Hebrews chapter 4 says he's tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. He even gets us when we think no one gets us. Our Lord understands. The reformer Martin Luther said that the incarnation, God becoming one of us in Jesus, is proof that God is not against us. 
People often walk around with all kinds of notions about God, but God is not against us. And this is the sign and the proof of it. God is not an abstraction or just an idea in our heads. God is not a tyrant or a despot. God is who you see when you look at Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, heaven and earth met together. This is the miracle at the center of all history, literally how we count our years. He's based on the coming of Jesus into the world before and after this happened. It's the miracle at the center of creation and God's plans for all of his creatures, including us. And it can be the miracle at the center of our own lives as well, as we turn them over to King Jesus. If you want to discover heaven, if you want to discover what that word even means, go to Jesus, because he's the place where heaven and earth meet. If you want the power of heaven to help you and aid you along the troubles and tragedies of this earthly journey that we're all on, call on Jesus. He's the place where heaven and earth meet. Heaven's king has come down to us. Let's get to know him. Let's learn his word and his ways with people. Let's receive his grace and his gifts, even as we praise, even as we pray, even as we commune with him tonight. Let's receive his presence and his gifts for our lives. How do you suppose the maiden would respond when she discovered that her true beloved is actually the great king and he humbled himself even for her? Tonight's a night for us to celebrate, to rejoice for our great king, for the good news that he has humbled himself for each and every one, even, even to the cross, as we remember and celebrate tonight. Let us pray. Jesus calls us to share the light that he places within our lives. And now, symbolic, we, we pass the light of Christ around this place as we sing the words of Silent Night.